Okay. We'll just start in the beginning. If you tell us about uh, you, have, you know how you first met Dr. King and how he uh, last roped you into all this. I met Dr. King when I was uh, 29 years old. It was the first week in February, I believe, 1960, and he was 31. The occasion for the meeting <clears throat> was a telephone call I had received from a, a Hubert Delaney who was a Judge Hubert Delaney in New York, who had known me and had been uh, helpful to me in making a recommendation for me to get into law school early admission so I wouldn't have to uh, wait another year. I was trying to get, wait to be good at Columbia Law School, but they said, no, positions are filled and you have to wait another year, and I don't want to do that since I'd already been in the United States Army. Uh, during the end of the Korean War for two years, and I was, you know, I wanted to go and get on with my life after I got out of the Army in 1955. In any event, so he calls me, he says, Clarence, he says, I am the chief counsel of this Negro preacher, you know, uh, this preacher in, in uh, Alabama, and Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. I said, yes, I heard of him. He said, well, he's been indicted by the state of Alabama for tax evasion, tax evasion and perjury, lying on his state income tax return. And that I have, as part of my defense team, two very able, distinguished Negro tax lawyers from Chicago, Robert Ming and Robert Layton. One of them, I don't remember which one, was actually the lawyer for the Illinois Department of Internal Revenue service, you know, encyclopedic on federal and state taxes. And then I have a young man uh, in Montgomery by the name of Fred Gray. Uh, all very able lawyers, but what I really need, Clarence, I would like for you to help me. I'd like for you to be my law clerk. I'd like for you to help in the preparation of the defense of the case. And when he first spoke with me, I thought he was talking about uh, doing research. Now, this is February 1960. And I didn't really think about it, but I figured, well, you know, I'd go and do research in the library and I would just send it to him, especially the library. Didn't have any, didn't have any um, uh, internet. I don't even recall whether we had fax machines. But anyway, I knew that I would. And he said, no, 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 that's not gonna work. No, you need to go down there. And when he described in detail what he was, in fact, requesting me to do, and I, I said, Judge, I am so sorry, but I, I simply cannot do that. And he was very disappointed in me, and it was very difficult for me to say no to him. That was on a Thursday evening. The next morning, very early, I get a call from Judge Delaney again, only this time he says, I did not know it at the time of our conversation last night, Clarence, Thursday night. To know Dr. King is in the air now. He's on his way to Los Angeles. He has a speaking engagement. And then he's going to be speaking as a guest preacher in the Baptist church over in, in a colored neighborhood uh, somewhere in Los Angeles. But I told him to take advantage of the change in time that uh, he's going to land about 11.45 your time and I told him the very first thing he should do is rent a car, come out and see you. I was living in a suburb outside of Los Angeles, Altadena, California. So I'm thinking to myself, oh no, but I already told the judge, you know, I couldn't uh, go down to Montgomery, Alabama, so I, I didn't know how I could credibly say I wouldn't agree to meet uh, Dr. King. Now, as I say when I tell this story, and I've told it on more than one occasion, uh, in 1960, Dr. King was very popular. Aside from having been identified with the success and earlier, four or five years earlier, when the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, he had also been on the, the cover picture story of Time, Look, and Life magazine. So when I told my wife at the time, who was now deceased, 
that Martin Luther King Jr. was coming to our home. You would have thought that in 2017 terms, that an amalgamation of Michael Jackson, George Clooney, Matthew McConaughey, uh, 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 I can't think of the fences, uh, you know, the great black actor. Benzel. Uh, Benzel watching there, thank you. And, uh, and uh, all kind of contemporary stars. You would think that that, that was, was coming to our home. Thursday evening, walks into our home, the bell rings. Got a bell there, he is standing there. Comes into the house. He's accompanied by Reverend Bernard Lee, who chapel with him. Um, my wife had prepared some little snacks for coffee, sit around a coffee table. After some initial pleasantries, he leans forward on the coffee table, puts his hands on the coffee table, leans forward closer to me, and he says, you know, Lawyer Jones, Attorney Jones, he says, you know, we have lots of white lawyers from the Midwest, from the Northeast, who help us with our cause. But what we need, Mr. Jones, are young Negro lawyers like you to help me and our people as we're struggling for freedom in the South. So I, I, I said, Dr. King, I, as I said to Judge Delaney, I, uh, I, I, I wish I could help you, but I simply cannot help you with me going down to Montgomery, Alabama. And then he began to tell me in a little more detail of what he was seeking to do or what he was doing. And I listened, then he asked me some questions about myself, you know. And I told him about, I'm the only child of living domestic household servants. I lived with my parents on and off before I was six years of age. And then they, uh, uh, I lived with them in the servants' quarters of the uh, household of the people for whom they worked as a, my mother a maiden a cook, my father a chauffeur and a gardener. I told them all that. And that at the age of six, thereabouts, my mother principally decided to put me in a Catholic boarding school run by the, founded by a woman's sister, Catherine, Catherine Drexel member of the Drexel family of Philadelphia, a very wealthy family. And apparently she took a part of her trust that she shared with her brother, also named Drexel, founded the Drexel Institute and other things. And she funded this school that had a plaque on the outside of the door. It's called a school for indigent, meaning poor, I didn't know it at the time indigent colored boys and Indians, meaning uh, Indians, uh, young boys who were from the uh, reservations in uh, New Mexico and Arizona because they apparently had mission schools. There. So that's, that's, that's where I was, that's what I, they placed me there from the age of six until 14 and I stayed there most of the time except during the summers when I would spend time with my parents wherever they were. And I told them that. And I also told them that my, that one of the most painful experiences in my life was the death of my mother when I was in my third year in college. She, my mother saw me graduate as valedictorian from a public high school in Palmyra, New Jersey. Never saw me graduate from college. Never saw me graduate from law school. Had one daughter, baby daughter at the time. Never saw her daughter, never saw her grandchildren. And that was, you know, it was very painful for me, you know. Um, and I also told him that uh, uh, when my mother died, uh, I was taking an examination on January 8th, 1952, the date of my birthday at Columbia College. And the proctor, 
taps me on the taps me on the phone. He says, "Are you Clarence Jones?" I say, "Yes." There's an emergency call for you. And they, I was so quick. I said, "Well, why don't you finish your essay? Finish your." So I finish my uh, part examination. And I leave the and I go into the office of the uh, dean at Columbia College. And he said, "Yes, you have to call the hospital. It's an urgent message." Uh, I finally reached my father there. They had uh, operated on my mother that day, earlier that day, on January 8th, um, for colon cancer. And um, the cancer, to use the words, the doctor's words, had spread so much and so severely that they had to remove, bring her bowel tract outside of her body and put it outside uh, uh, colonoscopy. I didn't understand any of that at the time. Just, they were dr dramatic in their description of what they had to do. And very clinically, they said, she probably has three to four months to live maximum, if that. That's, that's what my birthday present, <laughs> January 8th, 1952. I got myself together and quickly went down. Anyway, so I told, I told uh, Dr. King that. And, uh, and some other things. He leaves. At which point, my wife turns to me in a somewhat, not somewhat, in a critical, almost sarcastic voice that says, what do you think you are doing that's so important that you can't come, that you can't go and help this man that came all this distance to ask for your assistance? And so, as I've said on other occasions, I got into what can best be described as my lawyer's, young lawyer's bag. I simply said, and her name. That is simply factually untrue. He had speaking engagement this weekend in Los Angeles, and Judge Delaney thought that since he was going to be out here, that he should take advantage of being out and come to see me. But he did not come out here specifically to ask my, for my help. And then I added in a kind of anger at her and angry at the situation. I said, besides, aside, just because some Negro preacher got his hand caught in a cookie jar stealing, that ain't my problem. And if he wasn't guilty, he wouldn't have been indicted. She says, I don't believe you. He's your lawyer, how can you talk that way? I said, that's the way I feel. So as I, I, my first book was, What Would Martin Say? And as I described this instance in the first chapter, that was a cold night in Joan's household that night. She was pissed at me, all right? So, um, <clears throat> that was a Friday night. The next morning, very early in the morning, also California time, I answer the phone. The voice on the other end of the phone is just tripping sweet with saccharine honey. Mr. Jones? Yes. My name is Dora McDonald. Yes. You know Mr. Jones? Yes. You know Dr. King? He enjoyed so much his visit with you and Mrs. Jones. But you know, Mr. Jones, he forgot. He forgot to invite you to be his guest tomorrow. He's preaching in the Baptist church, in this church in Baldwin Hills. And I, he wanted to be sure that I reached you so that you could, your, your, your wife could come as his guest. Now my wife was about seven months pregnant, pregnant at the time. And she says, well, you may not be going to Montgomery, Alabama, but you're going to that church, still in a kind of uh, belligerent mood. So I, I you know, I, I go to visit, I mean, I go to see Dr. King in this Baptist church. The pastor then was Reverend H.B. Charles. Uh, I'd only been in Los Angeles for seven and a half months, but I quickly came to understand that Baldwin Hills at that time, if you were a Negro, of any degree of financial success, a doctor, a lawyer, a business person, and you had money, you probably lived in Baldwin Hills. It was the, the equivalent of like uh, white Beverly Hills or, or Bel Air. So I go to this Baptist church, the minister's the name is Reverend H.B. Charles, about 1,300 people. I'm sitting about one third from the distance from the pulpit. He's introduced by the resident minister. <clears throat> Dr. King gets up and he says, ladies and gentlemen, 
brothers and sisters. The text of my sermon today is the role and responsibility of the Negro professional to aid our less fortunate brothers and sisters who are struggling for our freedom in the South. So I thought to myself immediately that this is one smart dude, that he was smart enough to come and choose this place where all these black bourgeoisie, black bourgeoisie professionals were, just could not have chosen a better audience to give his message. I repeat, I'd never seen or heard Martin Luther King Jr. speak before. But I should also add, I'd never heard any other human beings with the attributes and characteristics of a human being with two arms and a leg and walking around somewhere. I'd never heard anybody. His speech and his voice was mesmerizing. It was spellbinding. And he covered some of the things that he said to me across the, sent to, across the table in my living room with my wife and I about what he was doing in the South. But in the sermon, it was filled with much more detail, much more texture, and much more power. And then, during the course of this powerful, mesmerizing speech, he says, for example, there's a young man sitting in this church today my friends in New York, for whom I have great respect, my friends in New York, tell me, this young man, his brains have been touched by Jesus. So I'm thinking, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any rational relationship to me. I'm curious. They tell me that this young man, a young lawyer, that when he goes and does research, on any problem, they tell me. In his research, he goes all the way back to the time of 1066, and William the Conqueror, and Magna Carta. So at that time, I began to pay a little attention to him because I'm thinking about, as well-spoken as this Baptist preacher is, how does he know anything about the history of English common law? After all, my lawyer, I know something about that. So I began to really pay attention. I said, this is a man who knows something, you know? And then he says, they further tell me that when he finds, when he does his legal research, and he writes down what he finds on a page, the words are so compelling, they just jump off the page. Now, at that point, I then become very interested, because knowing that it bears no rational description to me, I then begin to think opportunistically. I've only been in Los Angeles for seven and a half months. Whoever this young man is, he's described, when this church service is over, I'm going to find out who he is. Because if he's that good, he can be helpful to me. You know, he's got to be some, some, you know, so. And then he seamlessly went on. He said, you know, but I had a chance to meet this young man the other night in his home in Alpadina, California. And I said to myself, oh, Lord. And I sort of tried to just make myself as small as I could in the pew of the uh, church. Now, now, what I had told Dr. King in the discussion about myself and my parents being living domestic household servants. And what did that happen? I mean, you know, it wasn't any state secret. But I, I, I didn't think it, I didn't expect him to go repeat it to 1,300 strangers. So it was reminiscent of that hit song years ago by Roberta Flack, Killing Me Softly, with your songs. He was killing me softly, but telling me the songs about my life. And then he did something. That was very unfair. He said, you know, his parents were living domestic household servants. 
His mama was a maiden, a cook, and his father was a chauffeur in the garden. But he has forgotten from whence he came. And then there is an actual poem by Langston Hughes, the Negro poet and author. Caption, letter from mother to son. It's an actual poem. Now, in the poem that Langston Hughes wrote, it describes a Negro woman who is a domestic, who is a scrubbing, stares and she pauses periodically. And she says, I'm doing this for you, son. Life ain't been no crystal stair. So what Dr. King did, he changed the lyrics and made my mother the actor in the poem and changed the lyrics like my mother was talking. But when he did that, I started to cry. It was so powerful, tears, I'm sitting there. Because I immediately saw like a video picture of my mother in her, in her domestic uh, uniform, servant uniform, my parents. And I'm, I'm really disturbed. Church service is over. I said he was very popular. So he was standing outside of the church on the steps to the pulpit, signing autographs. And as I came into view, walking over to him, and he saw me, he says, you know, I never mentioned your name, Mr. Jones. I never mentioned your name. Sometimes we Baptist preachers, I never mentioned your name. I didn't say anything, I just kept walking. I walked over to him until I got to him. And I took my left arm and grabbed his right arm and took my right hand and put it in his right hand and pulled him to me. Still a little teary-eyed, and I said, Dr. King, when do you want me to go to Montgomery, Alabama? Now that's what I call, in writing about it, the making of a disciple. What happened with that tax evasion case? The verdict came out in April 1960 in Montgomery, Alabama, before an all-white jury, an acquittal. Now think about it. Here is a controversial civil rights leader that gets acquitted, acquittal by, acquitted by an all-white jury in Montgomery, Alabama. So when the jury was polled and you found out that the reasons behind the acquittal First of all, the jurors lived in the community. And the two tax lawyers, principally from Chicago, they just destroyed, they wiped the floor with the government's case. And it was clear in the published accounts of the trial that if somebody had voted for a conviction, they would have been, they would looked like a fool. They would, have been, they would have been, people would say, I'm not an integrationist. I don't believe with anything Martin Luther King did, but I'm not dumb. I'm not a dummy, you know? And so he was acquitted by an all-white jury. And I remember him saying, we did it. And I said, no, we didn't do anything. I said, Judge Hubert Delaney and Fred Gray and those two tax lawyers, that's what did it. And I said, I, I, want, to, I want to try to get over. He says, no, you're my lucky rabbit, but you can't go. So we all insisted on going out and have something to eat thereafter before I could go back to New York. Um, it, was, uh, it was extraordinary that local citizens put their own pride of not being made a fool of over their racism. <laughs> In that case, anyway. Now, I know you're probably going to ask me uh, maybe some other questions about Martin Luther King Jr. and other questions about a period of time. I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm uh, 
I'm, eight, I'm 86. I didn't say it, but I'm 86. Going on 87 years old in January. And, uh, you know, there's an African proverb that says, if surviving lions don't tell their stories, the hunters will get all the credit. So I'm more than anxious to tell some of those stories. Martin Luther King Jr., to the extent that we will talk about him further and other people, I, 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 I hate to um, burden you with the uh, consequence of my also being a, a professor. I teach in addition. And when I teach students particular courses I created, for example, called From Slavery to Obama, Renewing the Promise of Reconstruction, and we get to that point in the course, which is a 15-week course for undergraduate students at the University of San Francisco, was originally taught at Stanford University in the graduate school uh, for students getting a master's degree in liberal arts. But when we get to that point in this political survey of um, slavery, institutional slavery, uh, the, the concomitant doctrine of uh, white supremacy, take it on up to, the, to Obama and pass, okay? And we talk about the period in that journey when Martin Luther King Jr. in the 20th century comes on the scene. And I say to my students, I want them to have a very accurate remembrance of the position of Martin Luther King Jr. in the landscape and pantheon in American history. And this is the time I say to them, this is the only time during this course they come to my course with laptops and iPads and notebooks. I said, this is the only time I want you to write down every single word I'm about ready to say to you, because I don't want there to be any confusion. And I say, first of all, you should understand in the 20th century that Martin Luther King Jr. was the preeminent apostle of nonviolence, love, and a commitment to the pursuit of personal excellence. But in order for you to bracket his position in the pantheon and the journey of American history, this is what you must remember. In 12 years and four months from 1956 until April 4th, 1968, the date of his assassination, with the exception of the presidency of Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, Martin Luther King Jr. may have done more to achieve political social, economic justice, and access to economic opportunity and voting rights than any other person or event in the previous 400-year history of the United States. Translated in 217 vernacular, he was a bad dude. That's the person for whom I had no interest, but I ended up being privileged to work for initially as a political advisor, personal lawyer, and job speechwriter for seven and a half years. And we can talk about other things, but one thing I just wanted to set the record straight. When I said he was the preeminent apostle of nonviolence, he was. But I was not committed to nonviolence when I met Dr. King, and I made that very clear to him. And that used to upset him, because he tried to convince me that, no, I said, no, 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 that's what you believe, and I will respect you and try to be the best lawyer. But I said, 
white man puts his hand on me, he's going down, Martin. And he said, well, why do you say that? Why do you say that? I said, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, I was in the United States infantry, <laughs> the United States military, played football, you know, I mean, physical, I mean, that's, just, that's not my style, you know. I'm not for initiating any kind of violence against anyone, but somebody puts a hand on me, forget it. He says, well, I can't, I can't, you know, I say. Uh, Dorothy Cotton used to say, you know, we can't have Clarence involved in any demonstrations, you know, because he doesn't have the discipline to be nonviolent. I said, yeah, Martin. I said, well, that's why. That's why, and jokingly, he said, well, that's why I don't ever want you to be part of a demonstration. He said, I was going to look at my lawyers in jail uh, like that. So that's, that's just, but you know, that was, that was, um, there was a lot that happened during the uh, period of time, you know, I, I hear, as we, as we are now getting 2018, uh, coming on the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, this assassination, and in 2018 of the uh, assassination of Memphis, all sorts of media, all sorts of people coming out of the woodwork are asking questions about him, many of them asking questions which have what I call their own revisionist theory of history. They talk about... Uh, Robert Kennedy, they talk about uh, Jack Kennedy, they talk about uh, Malcolm X, they talk about um, President Obama, and um, and I paraphrase uh, something that is very relevant to today's discussion, um, spoken by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Everybody's entitled to their own facts but they're not entitled to their own opinion. Now, I know there are other people, I, I mean, there are people for whom I have great respect, like John Lewis, Dorothy Cotton, C.T. Vivi, uh, 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 Diane Nashbell, uh, Jesse Jackson, maybe others I'm omitting, of course, the, uh, Zerona Clayton and people in Atlanta who were who were alive at the time and Martin King was alive. They had a different relationship with him. The relationship that John Lewis and Dorothy Cotton and Jesse and Andy had was qualitatively different than the kind of relationship I had. I, uh, they were part of the, in one way or another, the SCLC organization. I was not part of the SCLC organization. SCLC didn't pay me. Um, there was a period of time when my work with him overlapped when I was also an investment banker in Wall Street, I think it's fair to say. That as a lawyer from practicing law and other things, uh, I know, as a matter of fact, that in, in one year, <laughs> I made more money than all the combined salaries of everybody on the on the staff of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They didn't pay me a damn thing. Everything I did uh, didn't even pick up my, occasionally they pick up a hotel, but most of my travel was picked up on my then American Express card in the reverse. But so, so and, 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 and that, in a strange way, uh, I think it affected how Dr. King looked at me and another person that was very, very close to him, Stanley David Leveson. Neither of us were in any way financially dependent, nor ever took or wanted a penny from him on the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In fact, as the uh, history will record, and it's uncomfortable for some people, but the fact of the matter is, there were persons like Harry Belafonte, Stanley David Levison, and at some times a white lawyer by the name of Harry Wachtel, and myself collectively. We were the collective financial reservoir that kept Dr. King and his family afloat. And chief among them was Harry Belafonte. And so 
I, I get really personally offended when I hear or read one of the more adult King children say, one, they didn't know about it, or two, they had expressed this anger at Harry over one thing or another, and I said, well, hold on. <laughs> He's the man that paid, paid for their schooling, for them to go to school. He's the man that paid for the, the domestic household servants. And when there was a critical time when he didn't have any money, it was Stanley Levison, Harry Wachtel, and Harry Belafonte and Clarence Jones that sent the King family money. So don't, I don't want to hear a damn ill word about any one of those persons who spoke, particularly Harry, who's 90 years old. Can, and, uh, can you tell us a little about, as long as we're talking about Stanley Levinson, can you uh, set up who he was and his Stanley relationship? Stanley David Levinson. I believe Stanley met Dr. King in 1956. I think it was introduced to him <clears throat> by Bayard Rustin. Stanley knew Dr. King before I did. Stanley was a ex very interesting person. He had an identical twin. They had uh, different names, but they were identical twins. You see them in the room, you were just, just like identical twins. You know? Identical twin's name was Roy Bennett. Stanley was a real estate management person, real estate lawyer. And uh, um, he and his brother, uh, they figure prominently in the history of the civil rights movement, particularly related to Dr. King, because he and his brother at one time had in fact been members of the Communist Party. In fact, they had, in New York, been one of the principal sources of financing for not only the Communist Party in New York, but the Communist Party nationally. They were very successful business entrepreneurs. They owned some car dealerships, um, uh, laundromats, and uh, at least Stanley did on the laundromat in Guayaquil, uh, Ecuador, all sorts of various entrepreneurial scrap metal, in the scrap metal business with another left-wing person by the name of Joseph Filner, whose son was, uh, became the mayor of San Diego before he sat himself on the foot over some sexual nonsense. But anyway, Stanley, older, and had developed a very close friendship with Dr. King. And when Dr. King began to tell Stanley about me, as I look back on it, I didn't know it at the time, Stanley was one of the people who encouraged Dr. King to see whether he could persuade me to move from California to New York so I could be more helpful to him because Martin had spoken so highly of me as Stanley. So that's, and so Stanley and I became good friends. He was a political advisor and draft speechwriter for Martin Luther King Jr. And I began to join him in that role. And there came a time when Stanley's former, having been an open member of the Communist Party, was used by the Kennedys, particularly Robert Kennedy. Specifically, there was a meeting planning the March on Washington on June 21st to June 20th in the Rose Garden in 1963, and President Kennedy pulls Martin Luther King Jr. aside and he says, I want to have a walk with you. I want to talk, talk with you, and they walk in the Rose Garden. And Kennedy says, my brother and J. Edgar says that uh, one of your, you have two close people working with you, Stanley Levison and a Jack O'Dell, and they are members of the Communist Party, and you've got to get rid of them immediately. And Martin, he tells me the story later, he says, well, I knew about Stanley, I did not know about Jack O'Dell. Now, Jack O'Dell 
had been a member of the Communist Party, been apparently on the Communist Party's so-called National Committee, but he'd also been an organizer in Louisiana in the, uh, in the National Maritime Union, I think. Or, and so one thing led to another after that meeting um, in the Rose Garden, I never will forget. Uh, Martin says, I have to see you urgently. And I said, well, no, I need to talk to you urgently. He says, no, I don't want to talk about it over the phone. So we agreed that I would meet him in, the, in, the, in Washington, D.C., at which point he <laughs> told me about what had been told to him by the president. And then he turns to me, rather funny, he says, well, well what do you think? <laughs> do you think Stanley's a communist? Do you still think Stanley has returned or has become a communist again? And I said, what are you asking me for? I <laughs> said, you introduced me to Stanley. <laughs> I said, and then I said something like, as a matter of fact, if Stanley Levison is a communist, he's got to be the most flexible human being of time I've ever seen. I spend so much time with Stanley. Every time I see him, the only time he's spending with his wife and his young son, Andy. And he, he and I spend so much time with Dr. King, and then he's managing his real estate properties for this woman, Alice Lowy. I don't know when he has the time to be the so-called communist, and he's never discussed it with me. Well, um, I, I, need you to do an in, I need you to do an investigation. I said, you want me to do what? He says, yes. So. Now that I think about it, boy, when you start giving in to uh, red baiting, um, he wanted to create a process where he could go back to the Attorney General and said that he had done what the Attorney General had asked. And so he made me the chairman of an ad hoc investigative committee of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And we were having a special meeting in Asheville, North Carolina, and I was to investigate about whether Stanley was a communist and then report. So I then go and I meet with Stanley. I tell him exactly what happened. Now Stanley's reaction, and I'm writing about this, so I don't mind telling you, so you're not gonna preempt what I'm writing about because the more people know the better. Stanley's immediate reaction you have to tell Martin that he has to immediately stop calling me. He cannot call me anymore. He said, it's clear that they want to use me in order to discredit him. You, you, have, to, you have to tell him, don't take any exceptions. He cannot talk to me. I will not call him. If he wants to know anything, you and I talk anyway. You talk to him, you can share with him. Okay. Now, Jack has another problem. He says, we're going to have to. So we had to work out a strategy. And his recommendation was that uh, we were going to have to tell Martin to say that he didn't know what he didn't know. He didn't know that Jack, whom I became very close to, loved, still love, he's still living. 90, I'm going on 87. Jack is about 91, the Vancouver Commission. And so. We had to terminate Jack to let him go. But the point is, um, Stanley's reaction was, I mean, instant. His dedication to Martin. Now, when I told Martin Stanley's reaction, he resisted. He said, no, no, no. I said, I'm just telling you verbatim. He does not want you to call him. He, he says, this you have to, you have to do. Now, let me go back and tell you about what Kennedy, what Martin said, the President Kennedy said to him. I wasn't there. Don't want to tell me what Martin King told me. Okay? And I think Nick Bryant, who wrote a book, Bystander, he reports the same thing, almost identical to what I'm going to tell you. Apparently, President Kennedy is walking with Martin Luther King Jr. in Rose Garden, and he says, you know, we're in this civil rights thing together. And if you go down, we could go down. He says, I don't want to be in a situation of the, of like uh, Harold McMillan. 
Harold Macmillan was a prime minister, Labour prime minister of the UK government. And one of his cabinet ministers, Lord Profumo, had been having an affair with a woman by the name of Christine Keeler, who at the same time was having an affair with a top Soviet espionage agent. And this, on the disclosure, called the, caused the Macmillan government to fall. And Kennedy said, if we have something like that, we could fall. So you have to take immediate action. Um, Stanley was brilliant. He loved Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. loved Stanley Levison. A very difficult time occurred for me and Dr. King and Stanley Levison. When sometime, I think it was 1962, I have to check my records, Stanley got a subpoena from the Internal uh, Security Committee, Internal uh, McCarran Committee or something, dealing with the communists. And so the first question of getting a subpoena, um, first question, did we, we have to tell Martin? And who's going to tell him? And when should we tell him? Then a related question. We both said, well, I can't represent you. I can't. And so it was such a sensitive matter. Stanley said, I want you to use your best judgment as who do you think should best represent me without having any negative adverse effects on Martin of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And I had uh, developed a very good relationship, so had Dr. King, that's right, with William Kunstler. William Kunstler was an uh, excellent trial lawyer, had his own practice, but did some work with the American Civil Liberties Union. And Stanley says, but I don't know Bill Kunstler, you know? So I had to go over and see William Kunstler in his office, and I had to tell him while I was coming to see him, and I had to get his agreement under certain specific conditions that he would represent Stanley Levison, which he did. And then, of course, uh, I told Stanley his ultimate advice that he should rely on is Bill Kunstler, not me, even though we were very close to the lawyer, but Stanley also said, well, he says there are legal issues and there are political issues. Yes, Stanley was a very smart guy. You talk about, you had a vision, uh, you were nonviolent until you came to uh, 1967. There was this, uh, you have sort of a come to Jesus moment. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about that? November 22nd, 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. November 23rd, Saturday, that was, November 22nd was a Friday. November 23rd, Dr. King flew up to LaGuardia Airport to meet with me because he was being besieged about having to write a letter the issue in response to the Kennedy assassination and the elevation of then Vice President Johnson to the presidency. So we spent about four and a half hours drafting a statement in the lounge area of Eastern Airlines. But I never will forget Dr. King coming down the, um, deplaning from Eastern Airlines and seeing me, but almost as if he wasn't talking to me, it was just like every talking to the public. He says, you see, if they can kill the president, they can kill enemy, they can get to me. As he's walking up, he says, we gotta stop all this nonsense about trying to protect him. Now,
three people, you and I and two other people, and Dr. King, we were walking down the street having a conversation. And a car would backfire. We would continue our conversation, and you look down, and Martin would be all crunched down. Immediately crunched down. He had come to the conclusion after the, assass after the assassination of Dr. King. So go back to it. He'd come after the assassination of uh, President Kennedy, my apologies. Um, that was more likely than not that he was somebody's going to kill him. No, I never thought about that macabre. I mean, we thought about it, but not so actively. Until that incident, and then I wasn't there all the time, I just for a brief period of time. But I heard how he was treated when he went to Chicago, when he went to school. Skokie, Illinois, or Skokie. And Martin said to me, he says, Clarence, I've seen some hate-filled eyes and mobs in Mississippi and Alabama. He said, but the hate I saw in Illinois was equal or greatest to any of the hate I seen in Mississippi. It was really shaken. I began to see, after this fanfare of the March on Washington, after the efforts of the Poor People's Campaign and it didn't work out and so forth, particularly after we went to Illinois, I began to see the absolute, sheer, raw courage. He was fearless. No, he was fearful, but he was fearless. Now, one of the reasons he was fearless is that he deeply, genuinely believed that no human being, no person, no entity could protect him except one, in his mind, being, a spiritual being. And quoting his words, and that was his Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody can protect me, nobody. But it, it, but it, in, but it inflamed a certain courage that was remarkable. And so I saw him over a period of time of how courageous and fearless he was, although he was afraid. And it humbled me. I had observed Dr. King, whom uh, he indicated to me and to others that there was no human being or anything on this earth that could protect him, that he was under the protection of his Lord Jesus Christ. So you might say, well, that's the deep belief of a religious fanatic, or, you know. Well, I wouldn't call him a fanatic. I would call him a deeply committed person to his Christian religion. But I also had a chance to observe him, who was afraid, but in the end he was fearless. And it humbled me. And I said that this man goes into situations that I wouldn't even think about going into. You know. I mean, willingly <laughs> initiates them. And I have to say that that's a bad dude. That is really a bad dude. And so I don't remember the exact date, but sometime I know it's between 66 and 67, and I said, I hope someday to be able to have the courage of a Martin Luther King Jr., because of all how bad I was trained in the United States military, 
how bad I was in terms of football and so forth. I had not mastered to overcome fear like he had. And so it was the example in which he became an exemplar of the power of nonviolence. And I said, he's got me. And that's why I, 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 just, I just became committed to nonviolence intellectually and philosophically and spiritually. And then what really got me committed was when he and I would have a discussion about the political effectiveness of nonviolence in which he said, Clarence, segregationist adversaries and adversaries that oppose social justice, the thing that they would like to use to blur out or to dismiss the content of the truth of the message of what we're seeking to do is to have all that blurred out by the form in which they think we're trying to communicate it. They want the public to focus on the violence of what they're going to characterize as violence. Because if they can get the, focus, the public to focus on what the, they will characterize as our violence, then they can dismiss the content of our message. So then I said, this is one brilliant MF. Because what he's saying, he's saying the reason why nonviolence is effective politically because it removes, it disarms a weapon of your adversary to obscure and defeat the content of your message. Now, if you can't tell me that that's not a brilliant dude, I don't know what. Okay. Now, fast forward. Okay. I've said this, I delivered this message to some of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Not that I want to make it very clear, not in, any, not in any way that they were advocating violence. But I told them about the strategic necessity of having the discipline in their movement. They can shout and call the man and show the names they want to call him, carry him whatever placards, but don't, don't fall for the bait of being violent because that's exactly what your adversaries want to do to obscure the truthfulness of your message. So that's why I said he was without question the most powerful person in the Western world in the 20th century in my opinion. And admittedly, that's not an objective for me. The, uh, I wonder, you talk about, you talk so personally about Dr. King, Martin King is your friend. Uh, in terms of personally, just, you know, was, people talk about how he was funny or irreverent. For a reverend, he was sometimes irreverent. Are there any examples of that, things that people would, you know... That would... Well, um, actually, quantitatively, uh, 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 Andy Young, and, uh, uh, for example, who probably spent much more time quantitatively with Dr. King than I did. And Dorothy Cotton, to a lesser extent. Um, my own personal humorous experience said, I know he was conflicted by what I call the public and the private persona about smoking. You know, I did smoke. And he was always, he was struggled. He, he really wanted to smoke, but he didn't want the public, he didn't want to be perceived as a smoker. And the other thing he felt that being around him subjected him to have to deal with a double standard. Because I would, you know, I'd sit down and openly I'd order some martinis, then after some martinis, I'd have a Jack Daniels. 
and and he liked bourbon, you know, and it looks scotch sometimes. Oh, sorry, we have to pause because of the sound. We we were, not that we never ate out in restaurants. What we did was always in, in Negro colored restaurants. But many times we would be having, we'd be the guests in homes that one or more of us would be staying. And we were staying, people would fix us dinner for him and others of us who were close with him. And I remember being on one occasion where he would say to uh, his host, now don't sit Clarence next to me. Because Clarence, that, he says, that young brother, he says, he may be a good lawyer, but he doesn't have good manners sometimes. Because you turn your back, he'll snatch a piece of chicken right off your plate. <laughs> Which I would do if I thought of this chicken looked better than mine. He would tell me like that. And so that's, that's how I've been raised in that boarding school. We had to snatch whatever food came to the table quickly. And uh, he had a good way of imitating people, you know. And... Uh, he would imitate Andy, or he would say, now, have you seen the way Clarence Jones walks into a room sometimes when he's in, in New York? He walks into it like, like he owns the place. You know, he's walking in there with his telemade suits and his Rolex watch. He says, I, 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 I'd like to know where that comes from. <laughs> you know, that humor. And he would also, sometime of... Uh, sometime in a kind of maudlin kind of humor in dealing with the possibility that he or somebody else could be assassinated. Never talking about, us, about himself. But he'll say like, now Andy, if you do something foolish and you go out there and get assassinated, killed. He said, I promise, I'm going to preach the best funeral for you. I'm going to preach a funeral for you. And that was the way of externalizing the fact that he had somehow talk about the elephant in the room that we all had to live with. Um, uh, he had great affection for Andy. Great affection for Andy. Great affection for Bernard. Um, sometimes Andy and Martin would be like two boys, you know. Uh, jostling with one another. Um, in Dr. King's case, I thought it was always a case of covering this 24-7 sense of fear, which he never talked about, but you could sense. And, uh, The most difficult time of his life was the 18 months before his assassination. Very difficult time. He went through what somebody, what some could describe as very difficult emotional times. Um, he, uh, he had a doctor in New York, Dr. Um, Logan, his first name escapes me now, Marion, to Marion Logan, personal physician. And Martin was in a very difficult period of time in 1967. And I know that Dr. Logan uh, wanted him to have some other kind of um, support counseling, psychiatric counseling, for example. And there came a time when Dr. Logan 
wanted to talk with me. And I wouldn't have a discussion about Martin King without Stanley Levison. And I remember sitting with Dr. Logan, and he's, you know, we're protecting the patient, Dr. Confidentiality, but generally felt that uh, the state of Martin's emotional health was such that that team maybe should seek some kind of third-party independent psychiatric counseling. <laughs> I'm sitting in a living room with Dr. Logan and Marion Logan. I look at Dr. Logan just as I'm looking at you. And I said, that's not going to happen. And which he was very fair-skinned. But she turned beet red. He says, what do you mean? He says, you're, not, you're a lawyer. You're not a doctor. You're not qualified. I said, I know I'm not qualified. But that there's no circumstance I can conceive of that I could directly or indirectly participate in any circumstance where Dr. King would see a third-party psychiatrist. Well, you're not qualified to make that judgment. I said, I know, but I am. <laughs> oh, you know, son, you know, son. <laughs> I had come to an immediate conclusion. Stanley is not here to speak for himself. But I can say that he shared my opinion. I know Dr. Logan was adamantly opposed to what I'm going to tell you. And which I says calmly, I just sat there calmly, there is no circumstance under which I have any influence that I would, I use a bad choice of words because he use those words against me. I think I used the bad choice of words because I initially said, and no sense of words, well, I would permit, I should have never said that. I admit that was the wrong choice of words. I, who am I to say? But I wouldn't countenance, I wouldn't support, but rather permit as a strong word. That was very blunt, and I said, if not within 24 hours, Within 24 days, the FBI would find out and they would get to that psychiatrist. And everything that Martin King said to that psychiatrist would be immediately in the FBI files. They can't take that chance. Now, I did not know it until well after that incident, so I'm not going to claim clairvoyance, but I didn't know how right I was until years later, years later, I learned under the Freedom of Information Act that every single telephone conversation that took place between Martin Luther King Jr. and myself from July 13th, 1963, to December 31st, 1967, when Ramsey Clark became the new Attorney General, every conversation was wiretapped secretly by the FBI, and the contents of the conversations written down, transcribed verbatim, and put in files Mark, top secret. Fast forward, 2015. I'm visiting with former director James Comey in his office. We have a meeting of about, I don't know, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. And one time during the course of the meeting, he has me get up and walk to the corner of the left side of his desk, that is left side from the standpoint of his sitting in there. And underneath the glass top of his desk is a photostatic copy of the memorandum from J. Edgar Hoover 
requesting authorization from then Attorney General Robert Kennedy to wiretap the phone of Martin Luther King Jr. and the counter signature of approval of former Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Uh, James Comey says to me, every new agent that's hired and every time there's a meeting of agents in my um, office, I, I remind them to stop by and take a look at that memo under the glass top of my desk and say to them, we never want this great agency to ever become like that again. So that's why recently when I was somewhere, I think I was the, the Aspen, uh, Aspen Ideas Festival, and they said, we know Mr. Jones, the Aspen Ideas Festival is a nonpartisan festival. We don't like to talk politics. The issue of the FBI came up and I said, well, listen, I've been through a lot of FBI directors in my life. As far as I'm concerned, the best one I've ever seen is James Comey. So I don't know about anybody else. I, that made a lasting impression on me. So why do I tell you this story about that? Because um, there was a psychiatric and emotional toll that was taking place. I was his lawyer. He said and did things in my presence that I think he felt comfortably in saying and doing because it never occurred to him that I would disclose what he had said or what I had observed to a third party. It just wouldn't, it didn't occur to me. And since that is so, I don't intend to do so now. Now I know the legal niceties about, well, the attorney, I'm not practicing law anymore, so I'm not theoretically an attorney practicing. You know, not theoretically, actually, for that matter. You know, lawyer, the, 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 your client dies, you know, you can be released. Well, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Under no circumstances do I feel released from an ethical, moral obligation because I look back on the texture. I remember very well how comfortable he was in discussing very controversial political issues and some personal issues around his family because he did it because he trusted me. He never even conceived that I would ever discuss them with a third party. And so I don't intend to start today. And, and speaking of those, uh, the, wire, the, the tapes and how they've come out, uh, what do you say to the detractors? People have come to use the, uh, you know, the personal problems, the familial problems he was having, the, the hotel rooms that have been bugged to, uh, to try to denigrate. denigrate his entire, his legacy. Well, for those persons who were part of uh, the Christian religion, I was raised as a Catholic, so let me first address the religious persons, and then I'll speak to the secular persons. Now, to those religious persons, in my religious training, the last perfect person I know, I was taught he walked on water, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was betrayed by one of his best friends for 30 pieces of silver and then crucified for a crime for which he didn't commit. Now that is the last perfect person I know about. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. was human, was not a religious deity by definition. He had what some could judge to be 
personal defects and shortcomings. He was fearless. His integrity in terms of his personal commitment to what he was seeking to do was inviolate. That he may on more than one or more occasions I'm not saying that he was. I'm not saying that he was, wasn't. I'm not saying that I observed them. I'm not saying that I did observe them. But to the extent that third parties removed, even family members, on circumstances of which I may have uh, been in which I would know, I would see or I would hear, He was a work in progress. And he was seeking to be the very best that he could be. His love for his family was unchallengeable. He was conflicted by traveling so much and by other matters that he may not have felt that he was being the best father or husband that he could be. As I said, the last perfect person I know allegedly walked on water, was crucified, betrayed by his very best friends. Martin Luther King Jr. was a human being and he was imperfect. But his imperfection within the total scheme of things in humankind during that seven and a half period that I got to know him. It was minuscule. Comparatively. I'm not saying it was unimportant. I'm just saying comparatively. Given the weight of all the other things in his life. I uh, Some people are going to be uncomfortable with what I'm about ready to say. Now, he was assassinated. When one is assassinated, you don't say they gave their life, they didn't give their life, the life was taken from them, you know. But the fact of the matter is, he perceived the risk and knew the risk and was willing to go forward any time, knowing, in my opinion, in the last year of his life, I don't think there was any question in his mind as to whether or not he would be killed. The only question in his mind is when would it occur. And yet under those circumstances, America, 50 years, April 2018, 18, 18 African Americans particularly, but not just African Americans, America, our country, we, we, we owe a debt. We owe uh, a debt of enormous 
incapable of repayment proportions. Soon to be coming up on the 50th anniversary of Detroit, the riots in Detroit. Now, we could talk about the, the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination in April 2018, but what people don't talk to you, maybe they will talk to you about. And some of the FBI files, the CIA files, want to get disclosed at that. Few people know between the riots of Detroit and the riots that occurred on his assassination, how close this country came to coming apart. People don't know. People don't know that we were just, just a little bit below the surface of civil war. You not only had the alienation of the African American community that would be reflected in Detroit, but you had you had white middle class people who say something's wrong with the system. They're forming the SDS, the Students Democratic Society, the Weathermen. Uh, there are all sorts of things who are getting alienated from the system. The astute observation that, go, that uh, Eldridge Cleaver writes about in Soul on Ice, he says why young Negroes are running to get integrated into white middle class society, young whites are running out the other way to get out of it. So the alienation, if you get Penn State, the Vietnam War, and this occurred, the uh, Vietnam War began to explode a little bit later. But the point is, if you read the 1968 Kearney Commission report, the riots, and as we will see in this picture that this is coming out, and, it, and some of the fathers, this country was about ready to come apart. And it's only by invoking the legacy and the power of Martin Luther King Jr. were you able to keep this thing together. America owes a great debt to this man. Owes a great debt. So, I'm here in Silicon Valley. So I sometimes hear people in the Facebook Twitter, YouTube, computer science, algorithm generation. Well, you know, he was a great person, so forth, but you know. He was a great person. He did what he did and so forth. He says, he, he's but the real contributions he never lived to see. It's all information age and technology, information age. And I say, well, hold on now. Now, I admire the brilliance of uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, and of Sergey Brin and Larry Page of Google, and of other people. I, I, I admire all that. But let me tell those young people who, have, who may see this interview, if you foolishly believe, if you mistakenly and foolishly believe that you would have had the opportunity in this country, in this society, to be able to create and enjoy the benefits of this technology without the contributions of the foundation laid by Martin Luther King Jr. You are historically ignorant, and you should be ashamed of yourselves. Because without you, there would have been no country that would have continued on to enable us to enjoy the magnificent benefits of your extraordinary technological achievements. So with all due respect to your extraordinary innovations, every day you should walk over to the Stanford University campus and, and genuflect in front of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute and say, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. 
after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, was there a sense of, and that high, was there a sense of uncertainty in the movement of where to, where to go next? Like what would be the next, either where the Chicago breast basket fight, or like, you know? Well, without question, first of all, I don't want to diminish the achievement of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There was a high over that achievement, you know? There was an especial high after the achievement of the Voting Rights Act, which came in the wake of the march from Selma to Montgomery and the efforts of, led by John Lewis, Jose Williams, and uh, Mrs. Boynton to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge to register people to vote in Selma. Yeah, they, that was, there was no question. There was a high when President Johnson convened a special joint session of Congress as he is introducing the Voting Rights Bill for their action. And he says, among other things, there comes a time there comes a time in the history of every nation when special leadership, a paraphrase, is required. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was at Adamantic. So it was in our Civil War, blah, 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 and so forth. And he talked about the special courage that had been experienced by those people seeking to walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And of course, you could have knocked everybody off with a feather. When, Doc, when, J, when Lyndon Johnson talks about introducing his new voting rights legislation for Congress to take immediate action, and he ends off by paraphrasing the words of the Civil Rights Song, we, by doing this, we shall overcome. Well, I wasn't with Martin King but John Lewis and others tell me who were with him when they, when, when, uh, when uh, President Johnson made that speech, they said that Martin started, tears started coming down his cheeks. You know, it was powerful. So that, uh, that, was, that was a very seminal moment. And so was it uh, important? Well, I don't have the exact figures, but with, let's just say within the five-year period of time after the Voting Rights Act was passed, right? You had a five-fold increase in voter registration in states like Mississippi and Alabama. Not only did you have the, an increase in the number of blacks elected to Congress, but more importantly, in various southern states, not just states of the north, you had blacks being elected to sheriff's department, the water board, the water authority, the uh, the school boards. You have them being elected to all. Right, but, but I'm wondering. But after that high, like with this sense of what do you do now? What, what's well, after the high, after the high, there was a great. There was a great. The greatest disappointment, of course, occurred. In 2013, I think, or when it was when, when the Voting Rights Act was challenged, in the case of Shelby v. Holder, in which Chief Justice Roberts uh, 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 said that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which had required those states that had an unchallengeable record of keeping back blacks away, they said, if you're going to make any change, you had to first come back to the Justice Department to get cleared, pre-clearance section. Justice Roberts says 2013 or 14, I can't remember the date of the decision. That's no longer constitutional. That was the beginning of the downward spiral. Guess what? Within 72 hours of the announcement of the Shelby v. Holder decision, states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, whole group of states, they convened special 
sessions to rewrite the voting requirements, the voting laws. Now, you would think they would rewrite the voting requirements to make it easier. But no, they wrote voting laws to make it more restrictive. So it'd be less opportunity. So that was a major blow. I was, I was just thinking about after the, at that time, after the, the high of the, uh, of Selma, then moving on to this, like, to, uh, moving to Chicago and to the March Against Fear, uh, the Meredith March. Let's just take Chicago. Is that notwithstanding the symbolic effort of going to Chicago and renting an apartment and living there and so forth, uh, he underestimated the entrenchment of segregation, say, in an urban city. Okay, he underestimated that Richard Daly, mayor of Chicago, that Martin King could do all he wanted, hold all the demonstrations, shout up and jump up and down all he wanted. You know, Mayor Daly said in so many words, you're in my town now, Martin King. I got the power. You don't have any power. And he tried to humiliate him, tried to undermine uh, his ability to uh, make effective inroads, notwithstanding. Uh, he went and rented and lived in a slum in order to demonstrate his own th authenticity. The political power to maintain enforced residential housing segregation was so strong in Chicago that he could not break it. Could not break it. And did you also feel at that point, would you have any discussions with him in that summer of 66, that, you know, King's coming north, but there's also black power for the March Against Fear and Stokely that's rising, the Vietnam War well, is rising. Well, black power, of course, it started uh, uh, in 1965 with Stokely Carmichael, but it continued to grow in 1966. There came a period between 1966, 1965 and 1965, if you can believe it, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that had been on the front line, the shock troops of the Civil Rights Movement, led by a coalition of young white and black students, north and south. Stokely Carmichael gets control of the student nonviolent coordinator and literally does what I call the Soviet Union's town. He purges. He purges the organization of all white people, all white leaders. And to give a damn how dedicated you were, if you were white and you were in the student nonviolent coordinating committee when Stokely Carmichael came in, he said, you go back and work in your community. We want to have total control, black power. That was, that was uh, a very destructive move. And it had, uh, it had it consequences that rippled throughout the movement. And did you feel that time that King was pulled between uh, marching again, the, to bring those oh, marches? There's, no, there's no question about it. He was seeking to find his ground. He was not as sure-footed. Uh, he was out, he was, how are you going to be sure-footed when you're in, operating in an urban ghetto? Remember, the Civil Rights Movement was a religious, church-based movement. You even had black clergy in Chicago who were uh, uh, beholden to Mayor Daley, who were opposed to Dr. King. You know, they didn't want this, want this Negro preacher from the South coming in. You know, they're coming in their territory. And so he did not, he was not, Chicago did not receive him, certainly the Chicago black clergy community and black political community did not receive him with open arms because he was going against what they conceived to be the self-interest of their patron. I'd like to switch a little bit to the FBI. When you, when you first heard about the wiretaps back then, was there a sense of, some people would joke about like starting a conversation, sort of addressing the FBI before? Oh, I'm, with, I'm the, not some people, I'm the one. Not the some I'm the one. Oh, if you hear about that, we would often have conference calls. And, uh, and I, I, I just say, as a matter of fact, conference calls sometimes would be originated by me. It'd be like 10 or 10.30 at night. And, you know, I'd have had two or three martinis early in the day, maybe a little Jack Daniels while I'm having the conference call. And sometimes when the conference call would start, I'd get very animated. And I would say, now, before we have this conversation, I would say, now, Mr. FBI man, Mr. FBI woman, you got your pen and pencil ready before we start the call? And Martin would 
criticized me. He said, Clarence, will you stop all that theatrics? You know, you don't, don't you know that the FBI has more important things to do than to be listening into our conversation? They got more important things to do. Don't you know that? Hello. <laughs> we were naive. Well, let's put it this way. He was naive. He was so, sometimes he would become so exasperated with my suspicions that the, the cruelest characterization of me, of all, he says, sometimes, Clarence, you know, I love you and I respect you, but you really like, you're like a left-wing McCarthyite. You see an FBI agent under every bed. You're just like a left-wing version of Joe McCarthy. I mean, that's the cruelest thing you can say to me. Did you have a, any feeling about, was it um, Jim Harrison, the uh, SCLC comptroller who was uh, actually an informant who's still alive to this day? Did you know that if there were any suspicions back then that that's what? Yes, I did. Did you talk, talk about that? I had suspicions, for example. Well, I said to Dr. King, I said, you have to assume. I said, I hope you know your children well. I said, they're too young. I said, how do you know I'm not an FBI agent? I said, how do you know? How do you know I'm not a plant? Well, I don't know. I said, well, how you don't know? I said, how do you know when every time I meet, I don't have something, a wire I'm wearing? He said, I don't know. He said, but I don't think you are. Well, why do you, why do you think I? I said, well, first of all, you're always talking about FBI, right? that could be my cover. And I would challenge him. He said, you don't know. But I said, Martin, you have to assume that right in the F SCLC, there's an FBI informant. Why do you say that? I said, they can put FBI agents in the Communist Party. And if the CIA can put FBI agents in the, in the Russian, we have the capacity to do that. Oh, no, no. And I had suspicions about the controller, Jim Harrison, I did. And I told him. And his reaction was he was the most loyal, the most dedicated employee. I said, that may be. I said, but, and then, and then, Now, Dr. King's been assassinated, right? And I'm looking at FBI files, my own, my own FBI files, and sometimes his FBI files. And you read through pages of meetings, particularly meetings that have took place in his office. Now, I remember the meetings. And as I read through the meeting, as I read through the pages, there's always one person who was at the meeting, but his name is not recited because the names are redacted. So I kept going back and forth. I said, there's something wrong here. Some of these meetings are actually in Jim Harrison's office. Jim Harrison was always in his office, but you don't see him mentioned. And that's when I said, aha, uh -huh. he was probably the agent. Now let's switch to another subject to show you the power of the FBI. Do you know that the number two person to Elijah Muhammad, John Ali, was a stone cold FBI agent? And that everything that went on in Elijah Muhammad, in the Nation of Islam, that went through John Ali or that he had knowledge of, was immediately transmitted to the FBI. So the FBI's got a person in the, in the ear, right next to Elijah Muhammad. So it was interesting. They wanted to have somebody there where the money was. <laughs> okay? Because there was always this allegation that somehow that Dr. King was getting some secret money, stashing money, so wouldn't it, wouldn't, uh, uh, couldn't have a more important FBI undercover agent didn't wear the control. But he used to challenge me. He used to challenge me because he thought that I was 
a left wing McCarthy. I thought I was, I could see, I saw uh, an FBI informant, agent under every bed. I was like the other side of Joe McCarthy, you know. And I just would always answer, I know how the FBI works. I know how important you are. I know that nothing they would like more than to discredit you. You know what happened. I mean, you don't know. I mean, I mean, the very next day after the March on Washington, April 28, 1963, the number two person sends a private email, email to Hoover. I think the number two person was Deloach, Deloach, Deloach at the FBI. And he says to Hoover, after yesterday's March on Washington, it is clear so many words, that Martin Luther King Jr. is the most powerful and the most dangerous Negro in America. And if we had not thought about stopping him before, we now must devote our resources to it. It is now clear that Martin Luther King Jr. is the most dangerous and most powerful Negro in America. So, From a political standpoint, and I just say this as a student of political strategy, on the least charitable way I could say that Martin King's efforts in the North were probably a failure in a less charitable way, I would say that he had underestimated the implacable entrenchments of the political power in the North to maintain segregation and overestimated the willingness of local Negro leaders to, to support him. And that neither of us had accurately and thoughtfully analyzed the new relationship of forces that existed in the North as opposed to the South. We forgot to remember that the hallmark of the strength was the Civil Rights Movement was a church-based movement. When you left the church base and tried to replant and tried to replace, put the tactics on a different kind of base, it didn't always work. We're leading up to the the, this idea of, of um, the growing sense of Martin going public against the, the war and those discussions that he might have had with you and Andrew Young about his journey um, to, you know, the, 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 the idea of publicly coming out against the war and the sacrifices he made about that. Well, when he had come to the conclusion that he could no longer, when Dr. King had come to the conclusion that he could no longer remain silent about the Vietnam War. Now, initially, among his so-called kitchen cabinet of advisors, Andy Young, Stanley Levison, uh, 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 Professor uh, Reddick from Morristown, Morgan State University, sometimes Cleveland Robinson, the labor leader, Andy Young, sometimes Harry Wachtel, but always Stanley Levison, myself, Andy Young, and also Walter Fortroy. Uh, the leaders of the peace movement, Reverend William Sloan Coffin, the Berrigan brothers, and Dr. Spock, very prominent leaders of the war against Vietnam, they were reaching out to Dr. King and wanted him to get more actively and publicly involved. My initial first reaction was that they wanted to preempt the mantle of Dr. King's national leadership for their own purposes. That was my initial reaction. And then I began to reflect on it and to see that 
there were rallies taking place in San Francisco and Washington, D.C., and in New York and Central Park, where there 500,000 people were showing up. It's almost five, in excess of 500,000 people, all opposed to the war in Vietnam. So I knew there was something. But I resisted because I felt, my initial reaction was I felt that they were trying to appropriate the, the legitimacy. They didn't have that one thing. Right. So we had a meeting, a couple of uh, meetings, long meetings, and with the issue of whether he should or should not publicly oppose the war. There were two principal issues that immediately came to the fore. One was expressed by, I think, Walter Fauntroy and maybe, I don't want to say what Andy Young thought, but I remember Walter Fauntroy. And he echoed a little bit of what I initially thought, and that is, well, hold on. Johnson has really shown a failure of leadership in the war in Vietnam, which he didn't initiate. It was just right as John F. Kennedy. He was the successor to the war. And politically, we had to be very cautious about whether or not we wanted to publicly criticize what could be described as having been the greatest civil rights president, or president for civil rights, since Abraham Lincoln. This is after the Voting Rights Act of 1964. I'm sorry, this is after, this is correct, that this is after the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is after the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And here we're going to publicly excoriate and criticize the man whose leadership, without whose leadership, none of this would have been possible. Of course, it was all possible because of the groundswell of the civil rights movement. We understand that. But without a president, response wouldn't have happened. And so it was very hotly debated. What I knew, and Stanley Levison knew, but others did not know in that meeting, is that sometime before he made a decision to speak out, he had received a cable, an invitation by cable sent to Paris from a North Vietnam, a peace group in North Vietnam, offering to meet him in Paris to discuss how there might be a way of ending the Vietnam War. He felt that after having received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, that he had a different special obligation rising above his so-called statue of the civil rights leader. And I said to categorically, you cannot go. What do you mean I can't go? I said, I said, that would be the worst possible thing you can do at this time. Sign, I said, uh, you know, the FBI and the government use it against you. I said, but they don't know anything about it. I said, excuse me, Martin, I say, you can believe within 10 minutes of that cable being transmitted from North Vietnam, there was a copy on the CIA desk at Langley, and that they've had it for as long as you've had it. And you don't need to go down that direction at this time. So we had that discussion. Discussions back and forth. And since I was equivocal, but mostly seemed to be opposed. 
He says, well, since you feel this way, Clarence, why don't you try drafting something? So I, I, I did try doing an initial draft. Now, my draft started out by just reciting dispassionately, objectively, clinically, just what the facts were about the war in Vietnam and the state of the failed of peace negotiations at that time by two paragraph summary. Something. And then I would go and I'd write <coughs> something I thought was very passionate about why there should be an effort to find a negotiated solution and end to the war. But then I would say, but on the other hand, and then I would write another equally balanced passage that would counterbalance what I had said before. And that's the way I went back and forth the whole letter. Say one thing, but then I would say I would give deference to both sides. Dr. King gets a copy of the speech, and he calls me up. And he said, Clarence, I thought you were my radical. I said, what do you mean? He says, I don't, I don't get this on the one hand and on the other hand. You, above all people, should know that the Vietnam War is either morally right or morally wrong. And I'm a minister of the gospel. I don't segregate my moral. I don't segregate my moral concerns. What is this morally right? He said, "You know, I love you. This is, you know, I can't. I, I just, I can't. I use this, but I'm surprised you even wrote this. Is the first time, by the way, that was the first time he ever rejected any draft completely. I would do draft things in which he would add, rewrite, and subtract, and so forth, and massage." but never reject out of hand. And he said, I can't use this. I'm going to have to consult with my brother Vincent, Vincent Harding. You know Vincent. He, he, Vincent at that time lived about four blocks from Atlanta. He said, we got to, we got to, I got to write something because I got to make a statement on this. I want to go to New York. And so at the end of the day, the so-called um, time to break the silence the speech that he gave on April 4th, 1967 to the Committee of Certain Clergy, certain Laymen and Clergy in, in the Riverside Church, publicly opposing the war in Vietnam, was written by him and Vincent Harding. Martin acknowledges that the, the writing, the thoughts and contents were both of them, but a lot of the writing was done by Vincent. So when I get their letter, that they had jointly written. And I read it, I call them up. And reflecting my earlier teachings by Catholic nuns about uh, English grammar, using old fashioned phrases like the topic sentence, I said now, I don't know, in the topic sentence of the 20th paragraph, down, are you sure you want to say this? Well, what do you mean? I said, you have a sentence that begins and says, the United States today is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, period. I said, do you want to say that, first of all? And if you want to say it, do you want to start that as the first sentence of your paragraph? Well, it's true. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, in the final version of the speech, what they did was they kept the sentence in. But they didn't make it the first sentence of a paragraph. They made it, they embedded it in the paragraph. It was, it was an extraordinary speech. That speech and the reaction to it, maybe when he gave his so-called Iowa June speech, April 8th, April 28th, 1963, using current parlance, maybe his approval rating was like, 60 to 70 percent. I can assure you, at the time they gave his speech on April 4th, 1968, uh, eight, three, five years later, his approval ratings were probably only 30 percent at most in the country. 
and what really hurt him and hurt me and angered me is that all of these people who have said he was the greatest civil rights leader of all time and extolled him for his great civil rights leadership then turned on him and then what really hurt him initially then he got over it, was when you would have people like Roy Wilkins President of the NAACP and Whitney Young, President of the Urban League, and all these, and, 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 and some newspaper, uh, Negro newspaper publishers, and presidents of Negro College and University coming out and criticizing him, all prompted, of course, by Lyndon Johnson to be his, he was attacked viciously. And a common denominator of the attacks from some of the leaders of the civil rights movement that really angered him is that, you know, Dr. King, we admire you for civil rights leadership, but you, you're a Negro minister. You don't know anything about foreign policy. You know, you don't know anything about foreign policy. You, you should you just stick to what you know. And uh, never saw, never did I hear such anger from him other than when he wrote his letter from the Birmingham jail. And he was angered by this full page ad that the group of white clergymen in Birmingham take out an ad in the Negro, in the uh, Birmingham Herald newspaper, criticizing him for having come to Birmingham to initiate uh, nonviolent protest and desegregation, and segregation. And never have I heard him feel so offended and angered and somewhat betrayed. He really felt betrayed. And he said over and over, they don't know me. Don't they know that I am a minister of the gospel and became a minister of gospel long before I was a civil rights leader? And as I told you, Clarence, as a minister of the gospel, I do not segregate my moral concerns. The Vietnam War is either morally right or morally wrong. The takeaway from this, among other things, that was the beginning of the downward national spiral, which he hoped that he would gain some moral legitimacy by coming and publicly speaking up on behalf of the sanitation workers in Tennessee. It took him a while to publicly come out against the war. He must have personally felt against it long before and knowing that it would create this rupture with, with Johnson. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, was it sort of, was it affecting him personally? Did you feel it affecting him personally, this struggle to when would be the right time to come out against the war and talk a little bit about uh, what you know about the, the rupture with Johnson after that? I think it was easier for him to struggle about coming out against the war, separate and apart from Lyndon Johnson, just on moral issues, religious issues. The issue with Johnson was a strategic and tactical question, best articulated by someone like Walter Fontenoy, and even I initially felt it, that we had to give him some pause. And that is, does he, as the perceived widely celebrated civil rights leader, want to oppose the president that enabled the passage of the 64 Civil Rights Act and that was singularly together with the movement from Selma and everything across the Edmund Pettus Bridge enabled the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Did he want to oppose this white Southern president who had probably been the greatest civil rights president from Lincoln. 
because he disagreed with him about pursuing a war that had nothing to do with civil rights. Now that premise I've just stated, he challenged because he said that notwithstanding whatever rhetoric that Johnson may give about civil rights, and particularly this was at a point in time where Johnson had announced a war on poverty. He said, there's only so much money in the treasury. And with all of Johnson's rhetoric and pious statements, there will be no money to implement what he says he wants to do because he is expending all the money, or most of the money, on Vietnam. He says, the worst thing I get criticized, but was worse than being a civil rights leader who may want to speak about civil rights, and some people will criticize me, it's worse to have a Negro civil rights leader who can't count. He says, I can count. He says, when you know you're a Baptist preacher, you've got to know how to count with the collection plate and so forth. He says, I'm not, a, I'm not an accountant. You don't have to be a math genius, you know? If there's only a million dollars in the treasury to fight the war, and you're, it's going to be seven, $750,000, uh, to spend for Vietnam is only $250,000 left to fight the war on poverty. And Johnson is giving great rhetoric, but he's not giving us any resources. He doesn't mean what he says. And that's, and that's, um, that emboldened him because he felt that uh, not looking at the reality of the use of money was really uh, was really was really betraying all of Johnson's rhetoric about what he was saying about the war on poverty. You talked about his um, this depression he had and how with the riots in the hot summer and how difficult things got for um, how he was not so popular. He talks about you know his unshakable commitment to nonviolence, like. Did that become harder as he became less popular and then the, at the end the message? Absolutely not. Never, never one iota, one millionth of an inch did he ever shake or deviate from his commitment to nonviolence. Never. Never. His position was that if he had to be the only person standing alone, he would still be committed to nonviolence. Never. And then, then the part of that came from something that I didn't have and don't have. He comes from a, a deep, a deep, a deep understanding that if he pursues his quest for justice nonviolently, that he is involved in a very noble, religiously redeeming cause that is Jesus Christ would applaud and protect him. And why would he want to besmirch on any way taint that possibility? Since he knew that he was right. He knew that if you want to be morally consistent and politically effective, you have to be committed to nonviolence as your form of social struggle. Otherwise, it is you are diminishing at best and at worst, undermining the prospects of ever being successful and transforming society and in making any fundamental transforming, transformative social movement, uh, you won't be able to do it. No. Because putting about his, the, the means will, the means will uh, destroy the purity of the, uh, uh, of the ends, no matter how um, laudable what you seek to do. If you do it through the process of violence, 
you will have diminished and demeaned the quality of what you seek to do. That's just spiritually. But politically, the brother was so smart. He understood that when you are foolish enough to pursue violence is that you give your adversary the opportunity to defeat you because you give him or her the use of violence to obscure the content of your message never. so that the content of your message will never be heard. Everybody will only focus on the form of your message, the violence. What about the Redemption March and the, uh, after the, after the, the sort of agent provocateurs and the, the rioting leading up to the assassination, you know, but, you know. Oh, the, oh, 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 well, oh, <laughs> now you're touching on a very sore subject. Uh, let the record reflect that for practical uh, 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 tactical reasons, not strategic reasons, I was opposed to his going to Memphis. Why was I opposed? Was I opposed to his supporting the garbage right workers? No. I was opposed because 30 days before deciding that he was going to go to Memphis, he had begged me, pleaded with me, to set up important meetings with potential donors in New York who would support the work of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is what I did. These are busy people, many of them business people from Wall Street, you know. He would have private dinners with them in which they would make a commitment to make a donation, significant contribution. So it was very difficult to set up these meetings. And I'd set up at least, I think at least four within the four weeks uh, coming up. And he tells me, I'm sorry, Clarence. I appreciate what you've done, but you have to cancel all this. I said, but I didn't come to you. You came to me. I said, yeah, I know. I said, but you can't. I said, I said you just tell them you can come to Memphis, but you can't come now. You have to come a later time. You can't come now. He said, no, I have to go now. And he says, think about it. How, how inconsistent, how morally inconsistent it is, and how much against its our overall political strategy. When here, the least of these, the poor people, we tried to get attention to the poor people's campaign, here we have, and I've been committed to working with the labor leaders and so forth. This is something the American, um, ask me, American Federation of uh, something, um, the union leader, they were involved in supporting the garden workers. I think the fellow's name was Jerry Worth. He asked me to come down and get involved. I can't turn my back on labor. Labor, as you know, they've been so good to me and so forth. I have to go. And so I said, Martin, I'm not saying that you don't go, but can't you not go? Do you have to go at this time? He said, this is the only time. This is the time when they most need me. So I was opposed to his going and really angry from a tactical reason because of, I had to go and change all these meetings. And then after I better understood what was going on, clearly it was the right thing for him to do. What happened, you know, is that uh, I think the mayor of Memphis was a fellow by the name of Loeb, Mayor Loeb. I think he had a very uh, hard-line, paternalistic, white supremacist, paternalistic attitude toward these, these black garbage workers. And that uh, prior to the time of the garbage strike, one or two garbage workers, garbage workers had been seriously injured by the machinery of the truck. And the work, and the things that they were asking were not revolutionary. It was like, you know, just changing the working conditions and hours and so forth. And so Dr. King goes, and one of the most powerful things that uh, you see during that time is all of the garbage workers and many of the union supporters had these 
sandwich board signs that said, I am a man. That was saying to Loeb, we are not children. We wanted to be treated with the dignity of a man. Now, during one of the first phases of the march, some of the young men took the wooden sticks that had held some of the I am a man signs together and broke them off and used them to smash windows, downtown windows. Martin called off his participation in the march. And then he went in for the next couple of days before the march would resume. And he went in from pool hall to pool hall on the main section of downtown Memphis, downtown Memphis, confronting some of these young gang members, telling them how counterproductive what they were doing would do to what we're seeking to do, and said to them that if you're going to participate and you want to continue, that I will only continue if I have commitment that you'll be nonviolent. If you continue violence, I'm walking away. Well, there was community pressure, parental pressure, because they didn't want Dr. King to walk away. Um, um, but it was, it, was, it was touch and go. It was touch and go because there were thug elements, boyhood gang elements whose, whose attitude, they wanted to take those pool, they wanted to take those um, sticks that held together the sandwich boards and use them to smash windows. And were you in New York at the time? or I was in New York at the time. And when was the last time you saw him or spoke with him? The last time I spoke with him was on the evening of April 2nd. late in the evening. In which he had shared with me the arrangements that he was going to be speaking that following night, April 3rd, in a temple, Masonic temple in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And it had more to do with logistics about Bernard Lee, you'll be in touch with the office, let us know when you're coming in. Um, uh, we'll have somebody usually come right from the airport, have a car take you right from the airport, to come right to the temple. So on the evening on the afternoon of April 4th, that's what it was. On the afternoon of April 4th, late afternoon, I was headed for the airport to go down and see Dr. King. I don't recall whether earlier that evening on April 4th he had spoken, I think on April 3rd he spoke at the Masonic Temple, but I know that I was on my way to Memphis. It was not on April 3rd, it was on April 4th early. And as I am rushing to go out of the uh, they go from my home to the airport. My phone rings, and I, and I just had an instinct reaction. Ah, I'm not going to answer it. And somehow, I said, okay, I'll answer it, if I was going to go out and hail a taxi. And it's Harry Belafonte. And I said, Harry, I can't talk to you now. I'm ready to hang up. He says, turn on your television. Martin's been shot. And I said, what? And he hangs up. And I turn on the television, 
And lo and behold, all over the television, Dr. King's been shot, assassinated in Memphis. So I, I mean, I'm stunned. I'm, I, I then get on the phone, I try to call down to Memphis. I can't get through, the lines are busy and so forth. I call Harry back, his line is busy, he can't get anything, the phone rings again. I said, hey, I've been trying to reach you. Martin's dead. What? He said, well, what are you going to do? He says, I don't think you do anything. Harry says, I don't think you should do anything. Uh, I think the Rockefeller family wants to help. They may want to make a plane available to us, but I don't think you should do anything. You should stay put to see what's going on. I was devastated. Within the first 10 seconds at the television that announced that Martin Luther King Jr. was dead, within the first 10 seconds, the very first immediate thought that came into my mind was, they finally got him. They finally got him. Because I knew it wasn't a question of whether, it was only a question of when. So I, I told, I've told over and over, my first reaction was, they finally got him. Do you have any memories of the funeral itself? Yes, I do. What I remember is getting a call from one of the, the close members of the Kennedy family by the name of William J. Vanden Heuvel, very close friend of mine, lawyer, able lawyer, partner in Allen Company, very close, former U.S., assistant U.S. attorney, close friends, Robert Kennedy particularly. And he said that uh, Mrs. Kennedy would like very much to pay her respects to Mrs. King. And I had recommended to the family that you would be the person that we should try to, can you help? And I said, yes, I'd be delighted to help. There came a day, it may have been the day before the funeral. I think it was the day before the funeral. in which Mrs. Kennedy was delivered to wherever I was staying. And we jointly were driven to the home of uh, Dr. King, Coretta Scott King. And I remember escorting Mrs. Kennedy up the staircase, up the stairs, to the King home. She's wearing a black veil very unsteady. She seemed to be semi-medicated. And I take them into the King home. And Mrs. King is there. I stand back as Mrs. Sacrament Kennedy walks over to Mrs. King. The now two widows embrace and they hold one another in their arms for a while. I'm standing back, I don't hear, I don't, I don't hear any of the conversations. I move out in a way so that I'm out of the room so that they don't feel I'm an uncomfortable presence. And I remember escorting Jackie Kennedy to the funeral the next day. I remember. We, we talk so much about the um King and his struggles, but like, you, and you, you're living history, this history, what do you see sort of the link to our struggles today? Like, what should we be doing today? What are the messages we should take from King and the work he did, the work you did together, to bring us, to activate us, to make today a better place? Go back and reacquaint ourselves with uh,
the 11 years of reconstruction after the Civil War. To read Howard Fass's book, Freedom Road, which is a fictional account of how the slave power tried to undermine the Reconstruction Coalition of White and Black People that took place. To go and read Professor Henry Foner's Pulitzer Prize book called Reconstruction, The Unfinished Revolution. to go and read the text. And if you can hear and see the voice and picture of President Barack Obama's speech at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in the 50th anniversary of Selma, which I believe of all the speeches he gave during his presidency on race, this is the best by far of any speech he gave during his presidency. To understand the challenges confronting our country, particularly those people who would like to succeed in the social justice leadership movement of this giant of the 20th century, Martin Luther King Jr. You have to refresh yourself on the 1851 or 57 speech, I must be getting old, that Frederick Douglass gave in Northern New York. in which, among other things, he said in that speech, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, it never will. You, those of us today, particularly younger people, who want to take up the sacred the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. That legacy can be described in two words, voting rights. I'm sitting watching television and some demonstrators are being interviewed by a local broadcaster in New York who are protesting outside of Trump Towers. And a young white boy carrying a placard and a young African-American woman carrying an anti-plump placard are being interviewed. And during the course of the interview, they said, well, who did you vote for? White boy says, I didn't vote. I didn't vote. Interviewed the young black girl. Oh, no, I didn't vote. I just know he's going to, and I thought to myself, I said, these people are out there carrying placards protesting Trump. And they didn't even bother to exercise the most elementary available form of power to register and vote. So my first advice to the current generation, we used to have an expression in my time about selling wolf tickets. People would 
talk bad. You know, I'm going to kick the white man's butt. I'm going to do this and do that. Well, it's one thing to talk about. You're going to kick the white man's butt on 125th Street, Atlantic Avenue, in the heart of the black community. It's another thing to sit down in Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> In 1964, Richard Vote talk about kicking the white man's butt. It's a whole different. So, if you care about the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., then you have to be willing to take the tools of power available to you to protect and implement that legacy. Because if we don't vote, if we don't challenge the level of morality going on in certain basic questions, we relinquish, we, we just, we, we dishonor his legacy. So, don't just shout and walk around with picket signs, acquire the political power to implement your point of view. That would be the greatest way to honor Martin Luther King Jr. The brother that's on the national scene, without question in my mind, is William Barber the second from North Carolina who has his bar on Monday. That is the closest living, walking, baddest dude today. That is, that is Martin Luther King Jr. today. He's got it. He's got it because he understands the necessity of coalition and the, and the necessity of vote. There is pending right before the United States Supreme Court as of this, well, I don't know when this interview is going to be aired, but there, right today, in, uh, uh, in the last week in July, in 2017, there's a major case pending before the United States Supreme Court on gerrymandering, rigging the voting system in certain states. I think the cases come up from the state of Wisconsin and the state of Texas. The results in this case, together with the results of the case in Sheldon v. Holder, which gutted the Voting Rights Act in 1965, will be the most important pieces of legislation regarding the exercise of power. Don't tell me you're going to be celebrating the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr. in 2018 and walking up and down and singing all these songs and carrying placards. Don't, that all means nothing. Empty rhetoric, almost to the extent of being insulting and denigrating. Unless you understand that the core of his legacy sitting on the tripod of being concerned about militarism, racism, and violence. That's, that's, that was the core. Nonviolence, concerned about militarism, racism, and of course poverty. So, uh, walking around carrying empty signs and placards and shouting up and down is nice. But as I said, perhaps in an earlier part of this interview, more powerful than the march of mighty armies is an idea whose time has come. In the 20th century, Martin Luther King Jr. embodied an idea whose time had come. And that is that you can summarize the condition and the concerns 
of the African-American diaspora in three words. Here, now, can't think of the other one. All, yeah. All, here, and now. That's summarized. What does that mean? We want all of our rights. We want them here, and we want them now. We don't want them in the afterworld. Now, I know he said very beautifully in his last speech before he was assassinated, I may not get there, but I've been to the mountaintop, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land, and I know that we as a Negro people would get to the promised land, but I understand that. That was his prophetic belief. But the reality is about power. Um, going back to that, the, the Meredith March, yes. um, you had several conversations with Dr. King leading up to that march. Um, can you tell us about the circumstances leading up to it? You talked a little bit about how you were, uh, what were your feelings about it? He felt he had to, to go, sort of, once, once Meredith got shot, he well, he felt he, had to, he felt he had to go, and I was always concerned about, you've made the point. You, you, know that, you know that the lion is roaring, he's ready to eat whoever walks into the den. Why do you want to walk into the den now? Let the lion calm down. I felt it was, a, I felt it was an effort on his, I felt it was an, an unreasoned, unreasonable, um, or what is it, not a reasonable weighing of the risk. He um, was concerned about whether or not his credibility would be undermined by the SNCC people who frequently refer to him as Delord, you know, that he, they would frequently say he would only come in in March when it was, quote, safe, after, quote, the implication was after they had done or other people had done the dangerous work. Well, the fact of the matter is, he was the person that could bring most national press and attention. And so his time had to be prudently managed. But he never thought that way. He never thought that, uh, well, I'm gonna wait until I can go in and get all the credit. It, not that it wasn't a scintilla of evidence that suggested that he thought that. He was the least opportunist person I ever knew in my life. Was, was there a sense that um, once he decided to jump into the march against fear, that, 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 that they could take that small, Meredith small march and convert it into something big? As yes, big? there was always a fear that there was always a fear, not just in the Meredith march, in other circumstances, that if they're not uh, SCLC trained cadre, so to speak, who were trained in the cadre and just nonviolence is that he would get all the publicity. He would bring the press, but he'd have no ability to control the people who were associated with him, and if anything went wrong, he would be blamed. That was always a kind of uh, dialectic contradiction he was in. He needed to be there. At the same time, he was always concerned that by being there, it would attract elements over which he would have no control, and if something went wrong, he would be blamed. Now, the other side of that is if something went well, uh, he got a bunch of the publicity, and this caused some resentment, you know, feeling that uh, he, uh, uh, success was un inappropriately or unjustly allocated to him when other people did equal, if not more work. So there was some element of that. And how did he feel about it? Well, in the video, he seems a little uncomfortable walking with with Stokely, with Stokely saying black power, black power. Oh, he's very, he's, he's very uncomfortable. Um, he's very uncomfortable, but he knows that uh, he has to be there. And on the one hand, to support the courage of Stokely Carmichael without supporting the message or the form of the message. Uh, Dr. King was not opposed to power. 
If anything, he understood the importance of acquiring the political power. But he also understand was to elevate so-called black power over white power would break and destroy that which he was seeking to build. That was a coalition among white and Negro people, black people. And so he guarded that jealously. And jumping forward to the, uh, the Poor People's Campaign, yeah. um, at that point, the SCLC had been pushed in a lot of different directions. Can you talk a little bit about the state of the SCLC uh, at the time of that? Of, of the planning of the Poor People's Campaign. I know there's some internal division about the, about the campaign as well. Well, yeah, uh, when, you, when you have a disagreements on a strategy, this wasn't just a tactical, it was a strategy whether or not you should do it at all. Um, this is recurring in a, a hostile national environment an environment that was less receptive. But he felt that, and in listening to the charismatic uh, um, role of Jesse Jackson and, and his, his leadership at that time, he felt that uh, he had no choice, that he had to be a part of and exercise a leadership of bringing poor people to Washington, similar to what A. Philip Randolph had done in the 1940s in bringing veterans uh, uh, to, the, to the, uh, the front lawn of the White House. He was trying to bring poor people to Washington so that the nation, the Congress, would see that these are real people who need help. And so what he was doing, he was putting his stature on the line. Um, he didn't have, in the local communities where he tried to organize the Poor People's Campaign, say in Washington, D.C. and other places, he didn't have, remember the Civil Rights Movement in the South was a church-based movement. What was the Southern Christian Leadership Conference? It was a conference of clergy of various churches. So you have in the Poor People's Campaign, you're having to rely sometimes on community organizations, on ministers that at best have a uh, tenuous credibility in some of their communities. And so uh, working away from the vineyard that he was most comfortable, that is the South, the Southern based um, uh, movement, he's moving into communities which are community based and which are talking not about ending racism but talking about ending poverty. And then there are all sorts of logistical problems because the contributions to the SCLC are significantly lower. Um, you had the divisions created by the Black Power Movement. Um, you had the divisions being created among the civil rights organization themselves. Um, he is probably, aside from, aside from SNCC and George Wiley, who had a well welfare rights organization, one of the few leaders that really consistently trying to focus on the issue of poverty. I happen to think that the reason, one of the reasons he was so responsive to be active to the campaign in Memphis, Tennessee, was that he was trying to, in some way, resurrect the credibility of the SCLC on the issue of poverty that had not been successful in the Poor People's Campaign. And here in Memphis, Tennessee, he had a chance to show he could deal with poverty, that he was unable to successfully deal in Washington. That's my opinion. And finally, just I don't know if you've, I just remember seeing you in the Aspen, looking at the, the video with uh, Michelle Norris, and uh, you talk about um, how the gospel was such an important part 
in those songs was such an important part of the movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the gospel was an antidote to fear, aside from being an effective organizing tool. And though you went to Catholic school, you seemed that you had a pretty good voice when you were singing. Oh, yeah, That's of course. It. I'm supposed to have a good voice. But, yeah, I mean, I was, um, you know, you can't be part, you can't be part of a movie. You can be a lawyer, you can be a doctor, but if it, if you're in a leadership role in which I was at different stages, I was not in a leadership role equivalent to a, an Andy Young or John Lewis or C.T. Vivian. I was an advisor. But I was very, they knew how close I was to the man that they adored and worked for. They knew how much he thought of me and knew I'd earn my own spurs of credibility. Um, you, uh, you, you, you could not have been around a, Mar a man like Martin Luther King Jr. that you would not have been inspired. He was an inspiration to me. If there had not been a Martin Luther King Jr., I suppose, in the history of this country, we would have had to computer generate and create someone like him to meet the challenges of our time. Dorothy, <coughs> Cotton, Dorothy Cotton sang, you know, she, her voice is beautiful. I thought your voice was really interesting. Well, my voice, my, my voice, uh, is, my extent is that I'm, I'm just a derivative imitator. First of all, I mean, I have. I know a lot about music, and I defy anyone to be around those many meetings and places that I was, where every meeting, every place involved, if it didn't start with a song, you wouldn't be in a place in which there would be some singing, and sometimes the singing would be at a pitch of hallelujah. I mean, people would be like what I call come to Jesus singing, and people would be jumping up and down. And, you know, shouting, Lord, amen. I mean, it was like, it was like a church meeting. So when I walked in and I'm being introduced, I said, I wanted them to get a flavor of the legacy of this man. So I, I walked in and said, I woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind. Set on freedom, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then I segue to, oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord. And be free. Now you've got to magnify that by 500 other people, 750 people at a minimum, of sometimes a thousand people singing that together. Sometime it was their collective antidote to fear, it was their collective antidote to deal, to give to, embolden them to deal with what they knew were armed, racist, clans people who would want to kill them in the first instance. So remember, the man whose legacy, the man whose leadership we're going to commemorate for the 50th anniversary of his assassination in 2018, remember who this man was. He was just not a leader, another leader. He was a minister of the gospel. He was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, a confederation of Baptist churches 
steeped in the religion, the liturgy, the Bible teaching, the Bible preaching, and the hymns and the spiritual that went along with it. I mean, it was our self-administered antidote to fear and anxiety when we could all come together and say, um, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And you cannot sing that song if you were with Martin Luther King Jr. without thinking of one person's name. And that's Fannie Lou Hamer. Now you talk about you talk about one of the baddest human beings that walked the earth is Fannie Lou Hamer. Oh, baby, baby, baby. She said to me one day, we were together, she says, you know, she says, you know, Lawyer Jones, I sure wish I could talk like you sometimes. And I looked at her and I put my hand on one of her arms, and her arms all were frequently swollen because she'd been beaten with billy clubs. And I pulled myself closer and looked at her, and I said, you know, Fanny Lou, I sure wish I had one-tenth of the courage that you have and you exhibit all the time. She said, I said, fancy speaking well, so-called fancy words that you call them. That means nothing. Those words don't have one-tenth of the power of your courage. <laughs>